Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Miguel Sana. Um, I work for Microsoft, and this talk is about how uh, be able to control script execution. Um, so a bit of context first. So this might not be, well, suited for every Unix, Linux systems because, well, you can do a lot of stuff with Linux, of course, um, but in some contexts, for some highly secure systems, you want and you need to really have control of what you're executing, which code is executed on your system. Um, so in this case, you trust, you should trust all the code that is running on your system. And that means for that, you need to have some security guarantees, some requests. You need to, you need to be able to, to know for sure, well, if the code really comes from you. Um, so you might rely on some existing security mechanism like secure boot or integrity checks. Yeah, for instance, uh, with a new IP LSM. Um, but the idea here is that once attackers get a foot into, into your system, because one day or another that might happen, um, well, you don't want them to be able to execute their own code, to be able to, well, you know, uh, bring their own scripts, uh, their own tools, attack tools, and so on. So what we don't have right now, well, we have a lot of stuff in Linux. We have a lot of uh, different kind of access control systems. Um, you can enforce them with uh, either uh, discretionary access control uh, on your files, uh, with files on live root, for instance. You can enforce some restrictions with mount points and uh, with some LSM uh, like Linux, Apamor, Vanak, or others. So we have a way to configure access rights on the system, but, well, talking about execution, um, well, we might not be covered uh, with all use cases. Um, so mostly, uh, the issue is with scripts. So in a nutshell, um, there's kind of two ways to execute scripts. The first one is to go to the kernel and to uh, use the execv syscall. So that's the first case here. And the second one is to directly, well, uh, execute the script interpreter and pass the script as argument. So at the end, it should be kind of the same result. Uh, you might use one or the other. But it doesn't really, it's not really the same for the kernel and for, well, security systems. So just um, kind of uh, about here. here. Um, well, what it, execution, execution is kind of uh, relative to what you want to execute stuff. Uh, so that might be one, there might be one definition for, um, well, CPU um, well, code but uh, there might be another definition for use space code. And even well, with some uh, Linux feature, you might want what you could execute, kind of execute um, arbitrary data, like you could uh, really well open a, a, a picture um, by just passing it to execv. But the goal here is really to be able to protect from unstructured Untrusted instructions. So um, the thread is uh, that an attacker might execute some nasty stuff, um, and that, well, most of the time goes through well, calling syscalls, kind of under syscalls, or directly accessing data. So, um, well, you can do that with more script languages, um, but for instance, it is not the case for uh, pictures or most. I mean, kind of stateless data like this. Um, and the goal is to not rely on, well, specific script interpreters. Um, we don't want to have, you know, a secure version of Python and kind of a well, totally free and restricted version of, of Python um, because, well, that would be an issue for maintenance, mainly, and for, well, be able for, to give this kind of feature to everyone. Um, and well, we also want to well handle um, kind of legitimate use cases. Uh, that, so that is not only about passing an argument to a script interpreter, but also uh, to um, handling or not uh, comments passed uh, to standard input, to uh, allow or not 
um, interactive use of shells. Um, so for instance, there, there are a few legitimate use cases here. Um, so different ways uh, that you can execute, uh, for instance here, uh, Python scripts. Um, so yeah, you might not use all of them, but that's not the point here. The point is that with these calls, um, everything goes, let's say, through the kernel interface. So what matters is that access control um, part of the kernel can, well, should be able to restrict this kind of stuff with um, the new feature. What should not be allowed because, well, on a really secure system is to only rely on a script interpreter to interpret uh, stuff. Um, so for instance, just calling Python and typing um, commands or scripts, uh, well, there's no way for the kernel and really for the access control system to check if it's trusted, secure, or not. So of course, um, well, there are different use cases and, well, for instance, for system administrator or end users or developers, well, you need to have this kind of feature. So that's okay, we need to handle that. Um, so there are really different use cases and there are also use cases where you don't want actually code to call scripts. Um, for instance, if you have a well, well-defined system services, uh, let's say a web server uh, without CG uh, scripts or so like that, uh, well, there's no reason for the, this web server to execute, well, to even call uh, Bash or Python, except maybe if uh, there's kind of an uh, injection um, issue in your website. So that would be a way for an attacker to get a foot in your system and then be able to freely, well, operate on it. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that we could do some, we could enforce some restrictions on script interpreters themselves, but, well, we want to have something consistent, to have a constant security policy through all the system. So we, well, the common point is the kernel, the kernel semantic and what the kernel can enforce. So there is really two steps here. The first one is to define what should um, be able to execute or not. And the second one is to enforce this restriction or not. So for the first step, um, the last proposal, the last patch version, so there, there are links uh, at the, well, the last slide, um, is to extend the execv at Cisco to add a new flag, so the, I think the fourth argument. Um, and this, the use of this flag with the code to the Cisco, like the, one of the arguments might be uh, the file you want to execute, then uh, the arguments you want to pass to this um, binary, and then the environment variables, and so on. And so if you use this flag, then the result should be kind of the same. I mean, from a security point of view, it should check if you're allowed to execute this script or not, and then return zero if it is okay, or uh, e-access if it is not. Um, but yeah, that's the point here that it is only a check. It, it is just a way for your space to ask the kernel, uh, well, would I be allowed to execute this script if I directly um, path them to exec v? So really, the idea is to tie to the same semantic as the kernel. The second part is to either enforce or not enforce restrictions on script interpreters, uh, user sessions, uh, system services, and so on. And well, I would say that's the main challenge here. Um, that's a quality challenge because, well, use space and kernel are not hosted on the same repository. Um, you might have a lot of different kernel versions uh, with well, running different kind of uh, use space, uh, different kind of version of Python, Bash, or whatever. So you need to have a way um, to let uh, to give some, some power to system administrator or distributors uh, to uh, configure either they need, they want to restrict stuff or not, according to what is installed in the system and what is configured. So the idea here is mainly to add new secure bits. Uh, so 
these secure bits are, well, mostly informative uh, flags that are set for one process and inherited for every new uh, children created by such process. So the first one is, well, for use space, for skipping Twitter to pass to the kernel, should, should I kind of follow the, the kernel security policy when executing a file? So that's the segbit sec exec restrict file. The second bit, second flag, is for use space to ask the kernel, should I let users that is running, well, the current process, um, kind of inject arbitrary script, and should I execute that? These are two complementary um, configuration flags. And if you want to have a really, a really <coughs> full control system, well, you should enable both of them. But either one or the other might be useful, even for a kind of incremental um, uh, change of your system to make sure that it works. So that was the main way to configure script control execution. But that might not fit for all systems. Some might be a bit more complex, and you might want to have more, well, some exceptions and so on. Uh, well, one thing I didn't mention is that by default, these flags here are not set, which means the current behavior is unchanged, so nothing breaks. But if you want to have a next and security policy, uh, for instance, to only allow a set of users uh, to execute some scripts, but with some set of uh, script interpreters, well, you could do that with an extended, for instance, SNUX security policy or uppermost security policy. Um, and yeah, so there's one way where we want to easily configure some uh, set of processes. For instance, if you want to launch a container with some uh, script execution restriction, so you can do that with uh, PSCTL, so simple call. And if you own the full system and you own the security policy, you can have much more uh, fine-grained control on that. Um, another thing to keep in mind is for this kind of restriction to be efficient, uh, well, you need to have something which is consistent. And uh, well, the idea is, for instance, if an attacker got a kind of a access to some shell, or you might be able to execute um, to change argument in an like, VC call with, a, let's say, a PHP issue or this kind of stuff. Um, well, the attacker might control, uh, for instance, environment variables. So it might, for instance, set, uh, well, Eddie payload um, is set to this um, uh, text, is set to this path, to this file, that, that feels the upload on the server, this kind of stuff. And of course, that will change the behavior of uh, the exec V. So for this to have something consistent, we need also need to uh, patch the libc to have yeah, a constant security policy through all the execution story of Linux. Um, so here are some drawbacks of the current implementation, some limitations, but uh, that should be okay for what we're looking for. Um, so first, uh, well, the idea is to use execv at the execv at Cisco. So there are two ways to execute a file. Either you pass a string, a path, so text, or you, you might also only pass a file script. So there are well, use cases for both, of course. Um, and from a security point of view, if you want to first check that you should be able or not, you should be allowed to, or not to execute a script, then you should first open the script, use this file descriptor, pass it the first time to the execve at Cisco with the add check flag, and then, according to the results, well, interpret it or not. If you use the same pass only and not the same file descriptor, there might be some race conditions. So from a security point of view, it might not be a good idea, but there are kind of legitimate use cases. Um, for instance, if you want um, to have a tools like find that might check some properties on some file, well, it might not need to open the file to actually read the file, but only get this kind of property. Uh, so that's a kind of flexibility Linux, Linux and Linux actually wants. 
Um, XDV only works with regular files, so you cannot, well, if you pass pipe or directory to XDV, it will just return, well, this invalid, but that's okay. Um, well, secure bits were, until now, only useful for, well, only used for root kind of access restrictions. So if you wanted uh, to kind of uh, limit uh, the use cases of capabilities, for instance, uh, well, there are some secure, secure bits for that. But the underlying ID is kind of the same. Uh, there are a set of four sections that are set for a process and inherited across all the children. For this to work, you well need to have security policy. So uh, one way to do that is, for instance, to set well the executable, executable bits on uh, every script that you may want to restrict, and also both executable code, but that might not to be direct scripts, but libraries too. But that should be okay. Uh, thanks to the incremental approach, uh, there's no need to change and to update of the whole system uh, at first. Um, you can start piece by piece. And of course, last but not least, well, if you want to have a secret system, you need to know what your code is doing and, well, writing safe scripts is, well, might be a bit more difficult than writing um, safe uh, usable code in other languages. Uh, so, well, you need to be careful and to check that, uh, well, some random input and some random data might not be uh, used and evaluated as code. Otherwise, but well, that would not be useful. So, in shell, that was not the first approach, but the 19th. Um, there were different approaches before. So quickly, the first one was to extend the OpenSys call and to add a, a, new, a new flag, OmegaVec. So that was the initial approach. Um, the second main change was to use the FXS add to Cisco. So that's a Cisco which is used to get and file properties, so really access permissions tied to a file. Um, so something to keep in mind that that is not enough to check if a file should be executable or not, uh, because some properties might not be on the file permissions, but they might, for instance, be on the mount point uh, options. You might have the no exec configuration set, so checking only with this Cisco is not enough. Um, then, we created a new syscall, which was kind of more generic, but maybe too much. And we are asked to um, really provide something which sticks to the kernel semantic, to have really the same semantic and to, to know really what the request uh, should do. Then we also had um, a proposal to extend, again, the access Cisco um, with a new mode. Um, but once again, I think that's not a good approach because here we're not only looking for five properties, but for, uh, I mean, five properties according to a context, so to namespaces and so on. So that's why we ended up with uh, this patch series, which is uh, actually not exactly what I talk about, um, I proposed some changes, so um, this talk is about, um, let's say, uh, the V19. Um, but that's the main ideas are already, are already there. So in a nutshell, there are two changes, two main changes. First one is to add a new flag to the XAV at Cisco uh, for your space to be able to check the kernel semantic if the kernel will, be, will execute or not a file. And the second is for your space to well, to configure user space in a kind of a generic way um, to, well, let the system um, express if um, for, um, let's say, a user session, a web server, whatever, if uh, some restriction should be enforced or not. Um, so we're working on, with uh, some um, 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 script communities. Um, so there's a proof of concept for Python. Um, and yeah, we're looking for more help uh, to kind of enlighten these script interpreters. So that's not 
Um, well, that's something which is new for Linux. That's not something which is new for some other operating system, like Windows. So there might already have, have some um, framework in place, which should ease these uh, new changes. And of course, we need to uh, update the libc. The next step is to send new batteries, which are much uh, simpler um, implementation, and to also include the toy interpreter uh, to let everyone see how this is used in practice, and to extend some tests, so uh, that should be sent very soon. And then, of course, to enlighten uh, screen interpreters and, and libc. So you can find some resources here. Um, and now, feel free to ask me any question. Thank you. So um, the actual check is done by user space. Yeah. And um, so why not just have user space do the check uh, using maybe a shared library to implement the, the shared code and not involve the kernel in this at all? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that interpretation and execution really is something which, is, which might not make sense for the kernel. Um, a Python script, there's no in Python interpreter inside the kernel. Uh, so by execution here, uh, well, this might be interpreted by user space. So interpreted might be the only part of the system that know if, well, this is code or not. So you cannot directly ask the kernel, um, well, sh should this data be executable or not? Uh, you need to lie to someone that will interpret this code. So for instance, for an ELF binary, it is a kernel itself. So the kernel knows if it can, well, it makes sense or not to inter interpret that. For Python scripts, it is not the kernel, it is a, a Python interpreter. So the trust is kind of delegated to this interpreter. And um, the system already allow this interpreter to be executed. So the system al already trusts this code to do the right choice. Yes, exactly. And so, so we have delegated trust to the interpreter. So let the interpreter make the decision on its own. And then, for example, so uh, because Python might be executing a Python script, or Python might be executing a, a snippet of Python code that was passed in some, some strange way. And in this second case, well, in the first case, we could ask the kernel for help. But in the second case, it's only Python itself that can uh, reliably uh, make any kind of decision about this code. So just let it make the decision and have also in, in peril another way to make a decision whether a given code should be executed. And this, uh, the po this policy can be even stored in some shared file on disk so they can update it easily. But you will need to have the interpreters doing the decision yep. anyway. That's yeah, that's what is done. There are only, I would say, passive APIs that are uh, made for interpreters to use them. So that's their choice if that's just tool for them. These are tools for use space to check some, well, if they should execute some stuff or not, but the final decision is uh, their own. So you might want to add some well, community configuration file, for instance. But at the end, from a system editor point of view, uh, well, you need to have a consistent security policy across all your system. <coughs> so you need to have something that makes sense for, uh, well, executing ELF binaries, for executing, executing Python scripts to load uh, shell libraries, and this kind of stuff. So, yeah, that's kind of a middle ground. Um, would you also consider uh, a disk image loaded by QMU as uh, interpreted code? <laughs> or or wh where is the boundary? Yeah, that's a good question. Again, the question is, what is execution? So the question depends on your use case. But one matter here is really, uh, well, it is a, really a security feature. It is meant for to be used by security, security systems. So the question to ask is, whether executing an amplitude virtual machine could, ha could harm, harm you, your system. So if you let, again, if you let an attacker launch a virtual machine, I guess there's an issue there. So either there's no um, 
accessible, well, let's say QMU, uh, accessible for this attacker. In this case, there's no question. Or, um, well, this attacker might be a developer. In this case, uh, well, there's no uh, solution. So really, the, the idea here, once again, it is, it might not fit, well, it will not fit for every systems. Um, um, developers need to be able to write the script and to execute the script, but we don't want attackers to have the same ability. So, yeah. There, there is a, there is a, not that much difference between this and running an ELF binary simply because we already delegate a whole lot of things to user space when we start loading shared libraries. And so fundamentally, we already have a case today with ELF binaries where glibc or LDSO is going to bring in a whole bunch of code and allow it to be executed without any kernel permission control. Yeah. Uh, have you envisioned uh, and extending this to also the, uh, the dynamic loader and enforcing this on shared libraries as well? Yes. Yeah, that's the idea by when I say, well, enlighten libc, okay. that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah there's a lot, bunch of details, but you're right. Well, if you want. So, last word maybe. Uh, so, these kind of restrictions are enforced by Windows, but kind of already by some specific Linux uh, systems, like for instance, Chrome OS. So, but they are kind of um, hacky solutions and not generic enough. Thank you. Well, thank you.